I really felt like I hit the career lottery when threat intelligence became the biggest thing ever. Who were you as a person during this time? You were in the military, then you got out and became a threat intelligence analyst. One of the most important things you could do in threat intelligence is set expectations. The first thing that people expect, especially the leaders, is results. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're supposed to be this automation expert. Where's automation at? Who says tech can't be human? What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the show. Glad to be back again. You are famous. You know that? No, I'm not. <laughs> you are like this famous celebrity persona in cybersecurity. That's why I love being one of your co-hosts on the show. But before you were this ridiculously famous person on LinkedIn, you were a threat intel analyst. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk mm -hmm. about what threat intel is, but also look, talk a little bit about your journey from being a threat intel analyst to the person that you are today. Yeah, so threat intel, for anyone that doesn't really know, the simplest way I can put it is it provides the context to make decisions or take action from a cybersecurity perspective. So telling the story of the threat environment, of mm -hmm. the hacks, of the malware, everything that's going on inside and even outside of the company so that you can make those decisions based on the information that you have. When we first met, you were so proud to be a threat intel analyst. I love that's it. that's yeah. all you spoke about. And I think it's for good reason because it's something that you had a passion for. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that one area in cybersecurity besides malware reverse engineering where mm -hmm. a lot of people just gravitate towards it naturally. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think there's a lot of money, opportunity, sure. and it's a great way to stand out. But, you know, looking back to your career, what was that entry point for you in threat intelligence where you were like, at this point, I'm now a threat intelligence analyst? Yeah. When I went to United States Cyber Command, I spent five years at the NSA uh, when I was in the Marine Corps. But when I got out, I went to United States Cyber Command when it stood up. And when I joined, I was an all source analyst. So pulling information from different areas and even types of intelligence to tell a big picture story. Mm -hmm. And I, I had no clue if this was going to transfer to industry in the cybersecurity community. But around the time that the APT1 report came out from and Mandiant, everyone was like, oh, we need threat intel in our company. So everyone was like, how do we get threat intel? How do we get threat intel? And I was like, well, what they really want is exactly what I've been doing this whole time, which is like all source analysis. So telling the story end to end of, hey, what is the information we need to know to make good decisions for our organization? I used to be a government contractor and I, I would work and speak to some all source intelligence mm -hmm. uh, analysts and officers, but I never really knew what they did. So what's the difference between all source and threat intelligence? So they're, they're pretty similar. So when you think of all source, think of the government. You're pulling from different types of intelligence because you might have some human enabled intelligence where you have people like the CIA, people like mm -hmm. Jim Lawler going around getting information. But then you also have signals intelligence that comes from the wires and communications and then putting all that together into a package to give that picture. It's very similar to threat intelligence. I would just look at threat intelligence as being specific to cyber and being like more in the, the commercial industry rather than the government space. So who were you as a person during this time? Like, were you someone that was like making good money? It sounded like you were in the military, then you got out and became a threat intelligence analyst. Were you making good money? Was there a reason why you went into threat intelligence? Did you love what you did in the military? So what I did in the military was a little different than what I did at Cyber Command and, and a little different than just your end-to-end -end threat intelligence. When I joined United States Cyber Command, I honestly had no clue what I was going to be doing. I just knew it was this new organization. I was coming on to do this thing and work for this company, but I really had no idea. I thought I was going to come in and do something super technical. I was like, heck yeah, I'm going <laughs> to get my hands dirty, do some hands on keyboard stuff. But then they showed me like, hey, you know, this is one of the products we do. We take information from here, take information from here, distill it down, give it an assessment and send it off. I was like, okay, cool. I could do that. But when do I do like more of my work? Right. They were like, nah, this is it. This is what you do. I'm like, oh my gosh. I got nervous because I was like, how is this skill going to transfer to anything other than the government? Exactly. So I was really concerned. I ended up going back to school. 
I was like, I, I got to get my degree in cybersecurity. I got to do all this stuff. The happenstance was just timing. I really felt like I hit the career lottery when threat intelligence became the biggest thing ever. Unfortunately, when it became the biggest thing ever, everyone hopped on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. So people were pushing things that weren't quite threat intelligence. They weren't quite mature. And so people were like, oh, threat intelligence is snake oil. Yeah. And so I had to fight a lot of my career to explain to people and to persuade them to understand that threat intelligence is actually really useful for a lot of different folks inside an organization and that it's not snake oil. It reminds me of like the AI ML, mm -hmm. you know, topic today where we see it in everything. And I think you still see threat intelligence in a lot of products. You see yep. XDR in a lot of products. Everyone tries to kind of get all of the acronyms and vocabulary and say like, yes, our, our brand and company does this thing. Yeah. One of the ways I like to look at it is you have all the threats that are in the, the conceivable universe, right? right? That's the big ring. And sure, you could look at all of that. You could look at the big trends, but those big trends might not even be something specific to your org. Then you come in a little bit closer and you have your communities of interest. Mm -hmm. And your communities of interest, this is where you have like the, the ISACs, the intelligence sharing or information sharing communities, where you're, you're sharing information like, hey, we're all in the financial services. And you can share those uh, that attack information because one organization, it just might be a matter of time before it gets to another organization. So sharing that information is important. And the most important information is the information that you're getting from your organization. So all the attacks that are coming coming your way, all the incident response information that you're dealing with, because that's really specific to your org. Mm -hmm. And using that for intelligence is a game changer. Yeah. Instead of trying to boil the ocean, mm -hmm. like we all try to do sometimes, it sounds like using a threat intel analyst person can really give you focus, give mm -hmm. you the ability to prioritize what's in front of you, especially if it's alerts, yep. incidents, pieces of information. What should a threat intel person expect? You know, mm -hmm. the organization has a need. They put out a job rec. What salary would you recommend for anyone that's trying to break into threat intel? Really start with, you know, with the range. I would say depending on the organization, depending on your background, you can make a lot of money in threat intelligence. I've seen people come out of college and, and hit that six figure mark pretty quickly, mm. especially if, let's say, you have a background in either journalism or research and you have some cyber security chops in some form or fashion. Maybe it's a couple certifications. Maybe one of the big projects you did was on some type of attack or cybersecurity across the board. So you could really start in the six figure range uh, once you really have a solid foundation. Out of the gate. Out of the gate, I think you could. Yeah, because I mean, think about it, that's what I did. I went from the Marine Corps to uh, threat intelligence, making 100K. And mm. then it just steadily went up from there. In the threat intelligence arena, I've made as much as almost five hundred thousand dollars a year Ooh. based on doing intelligence. And Fi so five hundred k, five hundred k. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was like four seventy. It was like my, <laughs> very my, modest. Yeah, 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 very <laughs> modest. But I mean, that just gives additional context for people to know that in threat intelligence, there is like a huge range from a salary perspective, but even from a, a work perspective, because you have everything from technical intelligence, like looking at things like attack infrastructure, hey, where, where are all these attacks coming from, Who who's attacking us, to something that's more strategic. So looking at nation state five-year plans, looking at the big socioeconomic, geopolitical environment to say, hey, these are where we should make our bets for our organization. I, I love that. And I want to I go a little bit deeper into the needs and not just the needs of like money, but what are the needs of the role? What kind of skills do does a threat intelligence analyst need? And also, what do they need from the support of their organization or team? Mm -hmm. I would say skills for threat intelligence, number one is communication. Because you could have all the information up in your head, but if you're not able to convey it in a way that makes sense or is digestible, it kind of just falls on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. So really understanding how do you communicate? And then also, how do you really make something that's worth someone digesting? whether it's a short form piece of analysis where you're saying, hey, here's an intelligence summary. This is what's going on out in the world. Just uh, just to let you know in case you need to address it in some way, all the way through hundreds of pages of documents just based on, say, an entire geographic area. So there's mm -hmm. a really big spectrum of the work that you do uh, in threat intelligence. So you don't have to feel like I have to know everything. You can even be a little bit more specific. 
on an episode, you asked me a hard question. And I'm not sure if I answered the question during the episode, but you asked me if you're interviewing for a job that is really important to you and you don't know the answer. Maybe mm -hmm. someone's assessing your ability to distill a report. They ask you, how would you do this? You don't know the answer to one of the questions. How do you respond, especially, you know, trying to get that threat intel job of your dreams? Yeah, I would say if, if you're on an interview and you ask a question and you feel like you should know it as a threat intel practitioner or even as a threat intelligence leader, I would be pretty honest about it. I would say hey, that I don't really know, um, but here's what I do know. Take a additional context from that question and give them an answer that you think would, number one, convey your expertise in the field, but also an opportunity to tell your story. You get the job, right? Mm -hmm. You get the job. You show up to work on the first day, you open your laptop, what's the first thing that you're going to do as a threat intel analyst? Are you getting instruction from like your stakeholders or are you self-directed? I would say it depends. If you're the first threat intel hire for an organization and you're building it from the ground up, I always start with requirements. Like what are the requirements? What do the stakeholders around the business? Because it isn't just the cybersecurity teams that need that threat intelligence context. You have leaders in the, in the C-suite. You might have a CFO that wants additional threat intelligence information for their purposes. So really understanding like who are all the people in the org that I can support with what I do. I look for information, I find the context to make it easier for people to make decisions. So figuring out what those requirements are. You might have to have coffee with folks, ask them questions. How have you used threat intelligence in the past? If you haven't used it, let's come up with these requirements together and see how I can make your job easier. Sometimes when I uh, shift into a new role, like the first thing that people expect, especially the leaders expect is results. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're supposed to be this automation expert. Where's automation at? And right. you, you might still be doing your research, you might be still doing your pathfinding, understanding the organization. I'm curious, what is the expectation from for results for a threat intel analyst? How long can you do this analysis of the organization before someone expects a report? One of the most important things you could do in threat intelligence is set expectations. Mm. I think any any job. <laughs> for sure, set expectations. Because sometimes you'll get these folks that, oh, we have a threat intel person. So they know everything about all the threats that could affect us. But that's not the case. There's still a lot of data out there that, sure, if you're working with a big, big company, there's so many things going on with that company that there's a small little threat that no one would ever see, no matter how many feeds you buy, no matter how much analysis you're doing, you just don't know about it. Mm -hmm. You just don't know about that risk. The smaller companies is a little bit easier because you're not as high profile. You might not have armies of hackers that are trying to affect your, your work. So that, that might make it a little easier, but I would still say that set those expectations, say, hey, this is what I'm looking to do. This is my plan. And this is approximately when you could expect to see results from me. What expectations do you set for the employer, your job? Like what kind of things do you expect that they'll provide mm -hmm. you so that you're successful? Yeah, I would say having those open lines of communication, because if some if I'm trying to support someone and they turn like a blind eye to threat intelligence, I'm not going to be able to help them. And any mm -hmm. work that I do in support of that might be for nothing, because if they're not reading my reports, they're not taking of my input seriously, then I just did all that work for nothing. So building that relationship, because just like all of cybersecurity, from my perspective, threat intelligence is service centric. I'm supporting other people's role. I used to support you, right? <laughs> you're a threat hunter. I was the intel guy. I'm mm -hmm. the. You're the super sleek spy. I'm the guy in the van with the headphones. It's like, oh yeah, you know. Just so you know, you got to watch out for this. You know, that's that's kind of what I do. But on a large scale, from everyone that's doing technical all the way through leadership. That's why we got along, though. Like, we love to collaborate. I feel like we love the open spirit of problem solving. Uh, but not everybody likes that. And mm -hmm. I know for some threat intel analysts, you know, they have their dream job. Maybe they have a great organization they're working for. But there's this, this drama, this dilemma for security teams. I think especially mm -hmm. for threat hunters and threat intel practitioners. Mm -hmm. Sometimes threat hunters feel as though they can do their job 
even better. They want all of the fame, all of the glory, yeah. and they don't want to use the threat intel that might help them. How do you combat that? And have you ever seen that in your your career? For sure. You'll have folks that I can do it all by myself. Mm -hmm. And sure, that might work to an extent, especially if you're in a smaller organization. But in trying to show value to someone, say, hey, here's how I can make your life easier. If you show up to a, a job and you say, hey, this is what I need from you so I can do my job, it's a very selfish, very egocentric mm -hmm. sort of way to come into an organization. But if you come in like, hey, I'm a team player. I'm not here to stroke my own ego. I'm here to get results. I'm here to execute. I'm here to make the organization more safe. And I'm here to support you at the end of the day. We have some news to share with you, a member of the Hacker Valley Media family. As of 2023, we became a full-time independent cybersecurity media company, and we're committed to bringing you the most powerful, thought-provoking stories in the field of cybersecurity. And we learned we can't do it alone. We'd love to invite you to our exclusive Patreon community, where we host a monthly mastermind where you can meet like-minded individuals in the field of cybersecurity that are trying to be more creative and be the best version of themselves that they can be. We would love if you took a second and visited patreon.com forward slash Hacker Valley Studio, and we'll see you in the mastermind. There's always a debate, right, about threat intelligence. I think, one, do we need threat intelligence? That's a question. Another one is, do we need a threat intel feed? Mm -hmm. And another question is, like, do we need both? I've seen, in my experience, especially being an automation nut, I would always try to employ threat intel feeds instead of human threat intelligence analysis. Yeah. Hey, there's this company, Virus Total. They have a feed. Yeah. I'm going to just pump all of my IPs, domains, and see if they're malicious with virus total. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's effective. I think that we've shifted, but I do think that there's still some of that residue and carryover from that older way of thinking. Mm -hmm. What would you say about threat intel feeds? Are they valuable or is it a little bit more complicated than that? So in 2015, they did a study on threat intelligence feeds and they said, okay, so you have the six biggest threat intelligence feeds in the world right now. How much overlap is there between all six of them? So you would think that the data set is much smaller than it is today. The overlap was 3% across all six. So that means there was only 3% shared IOCs for those feeds, which tells you that there is a big, big pool of information. And this is in 2015. Now we're in 2023, mm -hmm. where data has probably quadrupled. I don't have data to back that up, but it's right. a lot more data that's out there. I would say that it is still important to utilize feeds for that data enrichment, right? If, right? For additional context for things like incident response. If you say, all right, what is this IP? There might be a feed out there that's going to give you additional information like, oh, this used to belong to X, Y, and Z APT. This is when it was last seen, and this was the type of attack that it was seen with. So I think there is definitely a use for feeds, but I wouldn't say it's the end-all, be-all of threat intelligence. Yeah, I've seen the same thing, and I think not over-indexing on one strategy or one approach is mm -hmm. really important. I think today we see that with zero trust. Everyone is tired of hearing about it <laughs> because every cybersecurity strategy now says you have to have zero trust, otherwise you're going to be vulnerable, you might get breached. Mm -hmm. And back in 2015, I think, Part of that conversation was you have to have threat intel feeds. Yeah. But what about the successes? What was that first W for you when becoming a threat intel analyst? So one of the first big wins for my threat intel career and probably one of the things that changed me forever was this first opportunity to speak to General Alexander. I had just joined United States Cyber Command at the time. I was probably a week in. I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. I'm like, hey, I'm this hard charger Marine coming into the, the civilian world. I'm going to take over the game. And uh, I remember the, the woman that was leading the organization at the time. She said, OK, you're, you're so confident you're going to brief General Alexander. And it's like, oh, foot in the mouth. Like, oh, crap, this is actually the big leagues. I can't come in here overly brash or cocky like, oh, I'm just going to murder this. I literally took my time. I was like, OK, I have 30 seconds to convey not only the information to General Alexander, but to convey my expertise and being able to distill information, my expertise and being able to communicate to someone of that authority level. I really had a lot of work cut out for me, even though the event itself was like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So I remember coming in there, it was very, very surreal because when the general comes in, everyone's quiet. 
you have this whole watch floor with everyone at different monitors. But when the general walks in, everyone stops, turns, looks at the presentation. I'm up here at the podium. He's gathered around with all of his generals. And it's like, okay, what you got? 30 seconds, go. And I gave the information. I, I tried to be as punchy, as thought-provoking, as persuasive as possible. And it went off without a hitch. And what that taught me was, sure, you could be confident, but even if you're confident, you should still put in the work to ensure that your information is going to be useful to the person you're delivering it to. I think it goes back to the communication piece. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be a great communicator if you're going to step into the threat intel ring. Yep. Because you're going to have to give that information to someone. And <laughs> there's always a story that you tell about having like a hundred page report mm -hmm. and then having to distill it down to something that is more digestible. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a hundred pages of information that you've gleaned online, maybe you have like all of these indicators of compromise that you have from a threat intel feed. Someone's going to need to consume that. And I think we see that especially with socks as well. Like mm -hmm. you have hundreds of thousands of security events. You can't show everyone all of these events. Otherwise mm -hmm. we would just do nothing else with our day. Right. The other wins that you've had, let's talk about them because there was this big moment when you took the job at Netflix, mm -hmm. you made a post went completely viral. That's how you became a celebrity. And that's why we love you. Yeah. When you started at Netflix, it was almost like your paradigm shifted on threat intel as well. Like you mm -hmm. came up, you started thinking about it, systematizing it. Yep. What went into that and why did you change your your mindset with threat intel at that point? I had spent most of my threat intelligence career a part of big organizations like NSA, Cyber Command. I worked at big organizations like uh, United Technologies Corporation. And so you have all these big, massive companies that have massive socks, tens of people that are focused on security operations. And you have a SIM, you have all the classic cybersecurity solutions. When you go to a company like Netflix, everything's different. Mm -hmm. Everything is custom built. All the processes are different. Even the people, very engineering minded, not so much on the analysis and production side. So I come in expecting to have some of the same resources that I had before, and they weren't there. Right. They just weren't there. Completely different. So I'm like, wait a minute. Like wait no a minute. sock, right? Yeah, no sock. They didn't have a SIM at the time. And I was just like, all right, so what do, what do I do? What do I do? And I was like, okay, I've gone into so many different organizations to help them build threat intelligence. What would I recommend to me if I was coming in as a consultant? And I just went back to the basics, and that's where the easy framework came from. Would you say that the person that you were when you first got into Threat Intel, like right after you got the military, and this version of you joining Netflix, were they the same person? Were they different? Or was it a little bit of both? I would say very different. Um, I, I think we talked about this very, very, very early on in the podcast. I look at myself as like versions, right? Mm -hmm. And I look at really big pivotal moments in my life as like when I go to that next version, 2.0, right. 3.0. I don't know, I think I'm at like 5.0 <laughs> at this point. But yeah, I would say that the person that got out of the Marine Corps and went in Cyber Command is very different than the person that went to Netflix. It's very different than the person that struck out on his own for Hacker Valley. At the root of it, do you think that you're the same or is... Is it like a completely different, like all of that old skin is now shed and it's new, Chris, or is there like some, like a seed that's still within you that's very similar? I think most people, there's a seed in them that's just constant, mm -hmm. right? How, how you handle some of that internal turmoil or how you handle some of that stuff from your past might de depend on both personality and personal growth and development. But I do think at my core, there's a lot of me that's the same. But sometimes my behaviors are different because you learn and you grow as a person. You have ignorance, but then you learn. You're like, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You get additional information like, ooh, I'm going to adopt that into my life. So you're always constantly iterating as a person to get better for cybersecurity and for life. I'm sure if someone pulled up LinkedIn, they would be like, yeah, that's a completely different person. <laughs> if, you, if you went to, I'm sure, like your LinkedIn or even any social platform that you were using before – the days of Netflix and before we started the podcast mm -hmm. to today, it would be night and day. And I think that's also one of the parts of standing out in cybersecurity, let alone threat intelligence. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people reach out to you about how do I stand out in threat intel? What is your framework there and what is some of your advice? 
I started a company called Astro Cyber Solutions, and I started working at the House of Representatives. I was helping them stand up threat intelligence, and I was working with some of the engineers, and I wanted engineers like, hey, yeah, this is my LinkedIn. I had a LinkedIn. Maybe I had like a 100 <laughs> followers or something like that, but it literally had like two of my positions. There was no summary. The picture was kind of wonky, and that was it. And he looks up, and he's like, oh, let me see your profile, and he connects. He's like, hey, man, you got to work on this. I was Ooh. like, what do you mean? He's like, this LinkedIn is terrible. I was like, oh, okay, good feedback. Then I launched in like, okay, let me get a good picture. Let me flesh some of this stuff out. And then when I got to Netflix a couple of years later, the all that viral stuff happened. I was like, maybe this is my catch me outside moment, right? <laughs> I'm going to use this as um, momentum for me, but then also for the brand. Mm -hmm. of getting things out there, right? If I have a little bit of attention, like, hey, maybe I could use this for good. Maybe I could use this for things like representation. Maybe I could use this for stuff like encouragement. Maybe I could just start giving out some of the information that I've learned over my career to people out there. I think that's a big difference between threat intel and any other position in cybersecurity is that you're always building a personal brand and threat intelligence. Big time. Because you're presenting to people. You're mm -hmm. sharing information. Someone has to trust you. They have to, one, know that you're, you exist yep. and that your function is there. They have to trust the information that you're delivering to them. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that like having a LinkedIn is almost like having a website. Like that's your front facing place for that people outside of your organization are going to learn about you, learn mm -hmm. about your work. You've even introduced some uh, threat intel analysts to become authors. Mm -hmm. What was that experience? Yeah, so I would say that the threat intelligence community is a tight circle, right? Right. Uh, a lot of us go to the CTI summit with SANS, and so we're always like leveraging each other. Like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Because really, everyone unites together. Even if you're a competitor for cybersecurity company, like, hey, you know, we're, we're against each other. When it comes to using information, we tend to band together because mm -hmm. it's all one team, one fight at the end of the day. It's not like if I give you some information that's going to protect you, it's going to make my company worse. I just think that's a, a short-sighted way to look at it. But just encouraging people to put content out there. Will I write a book one day? Maybe. It just seems so <laughs> daunting. But yeah, I have friends that have written books. John DiMaggio, you know, he wrote a book. You know, Chase Cunningham wrote a book. Valentina. Uh, yeah, Valentina wrote a book. So I, I love the fact that people have the grit to create a book that supports people in the threat intelligence space. I really hope that someone's listening right now <laughs> and they're like right about to close out, get, get their threat intel career yeah. started because I think it's super exciting. Before they get started, what is that one piece of advice that you would give someone that is trying to break into threat intel or transition into threat intel to have the best opportunity and best experience of you know getting that job? I would say threat intelligence analysts or aspiring threat intelligence analysts need to be really good at looking at sources, deeming whether they're useful or not, throwing away the noise, and then grabbing the signal and using it. A lot of times when you come into threat intelligence and you're trying to make an assessment, you can have analysis paralysis because there's so much information like, oh, one source says this, one source says that. How do I calibrate and differentiate between what is good and useful for my organization and what isn't? And that's just going to come from repetition, mm -hmm. constantly reading different news sources like, oh, this is a great news source. Every time they put something out, it's pretty good. Up oh, this threat feed, whenever they send their PDF, for some odd reason, it always has like Google's quad eight in it. So I can't I know I can't completely rip the information out of this document and put it in something like a firewall. So really just getting really clear and orient yourself to what information is out there. How do I distill it down for my organization? And mm -hmm. then how do I make it so that it's impactful for the org? It's like the OODA loop. Observe, mm -hmm. orient, decide, and then act. Exactly. 100%. Well, you heard it here first. When you're ready to get started, definitely reach out to Chris. Look at his resources as well. You got the easy framework mm -hmm. and uh, quite a few videos on YouTube. We will drop them into the show notes for everyone to check out. And with that, we'll see everyone next time.